Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ma ba'd Al Hafiz ibn Rajab rahmatullahi alayhi said in his book the difference between advising and condemning he said furthermore there is no difference between criticizing narrators of one of the hadith scholars the hafaz and distinguishing whose reports are to be accepted from them and whose reports are not in between clarifying the mistake of one who has erred with regards to understanding the meanings of the book and the sunnah interpreted some aspect of it incorrectly and who has adhered to something else this clarifying was done so that this individual would not be followed in that which he erred the scholars have also unanimously agreed upon the permissibility of doing this clarification so ibn rajab Hafidhullah Ta'ala uh, is letting us know that criticizing individuals and clarifying mistakes is something that the Salaf of this Ummah have unanimously agreed upon. Meaning the Imams of this religion completely, we're not just talking about the first three generations, but we're talking about Imat al Hadith and those who came after them, that it is consensus that mistakes have to be clarified because you're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion. And as we mentioned before, this is from uh, commanding the good and forbidding the evil. This is why we find that the books they authored concerning the various sciences of the religion, such as tafsir, explanation of hadith, fiqh, the difference of opinions amongst the scholars, and so on are filled with arguments and refutations of the statements of those who voiced weak opinions from the scholars of the past and present, from the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, and those after them, and we already mentioned this, uh, highlighted some examples from, uh, from some of the Sahaba, not one of the people of knowledge abandoned this clarification nor would he claim in his refutation to disparage, dispraise, or defame the individual who saying he was refuting unless the author he was refuting was from those whose speech consisted of wickedness and who displayed vile manners when expressing himself. So if a person, of course, is a person of wickedness, a person of bid'ah, meaning that they are, their usul, their foundation in the religion is against the foundation of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, is against what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with is against what the Salaf of this Ummah had consensus upon. And they have a new, newly invented uh, Aqidah or a newly invented ideology or a newly invented methodology, menhaj, of practicing the religion or giving da'wah. Then this person does not maintain, we do not maintain the respect for this person that people may have for them if they're a person of innovation. But if they're a person from Ahl Sunnah who made a mistake, then of course their honor is upheld, but their mistake is uh, clarified and refuted. And they're not to be followed in that. And this refutation was based upon sound arguments and stable proofs. Again, this requires knowledge and it requires adilla, strong sound argument. So when you refute, when someone is uh, refuting and what's an acceptable refutation is not one based on desires and speaking about individuals' personality and their looks and all of these things which are not necessarily, uh, you know, have nothing to do with the deen, but rather you are refuting them in accordance with their mistakes. You are refuting them with their mukhalafat, the, the, way, the ways in which they erred and deviated from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is done with proofs. This is done with Islamic knowledge and sound proof from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. The reason for all of this was due to the unanimous agreement of the scholars of this religion that the truth which Allah sent his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with must be known, must be made known, and so that all of the religion can be purely for Allah alone, and so that His word can be the highest. So this is ta'zim 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the message of, uh, of, of, of Islam. Then the Imam said, furthermore, all of them acknowledge that grasping the entirety of the knowledge without neglecting any part of it is not a level that has been reached by any of them, nor has anyone from the scholars of the past or those of the present claimed to have reached this. So this is the humility of the scholars. At the same time, it is a, it's a realization of the truth that nobody encompasses all knowledge of the religion. We have to know this, no matter how much we love our ulama, that every aspect in the deen, can we say so-and-so is perfect or to be followed in? Of course not. And so this is what we have to realize, and this is a clarification for those people who blind follow and who have ta'asib, who have a type of prejudice towards a particular scholar, a particular view. Sheikh so-and-so was always correct. Sheikh so-and-so spoke about this. This is enough. Sheikh so-and-so refuted so-and-so. Halas, that person must be uh, an innovator. Whatever the case may be. No, everyone must have evidence for their claims. For this reason, the Imams of the Salaf, those whose knowledge and merits are widely and unanimously agreed upon, used to accept the truth from anyone that disclosed it to them, even if that person was young. So that, that's the minhaj of Ahl Sunnah. That is the minhaj, the methodology of the Ahl Sunnah, is accepting the truth from wherever it comes. So, for example, if someone I have problems with, or someone who is even an innovator, or a non-Muslim, whoever, wherever the truth comes, you have to accept the truth. You cannot belittle the truth. And that requires humility and humbleness. Maybe perhaps someone could be very young and they could correct you in something, something related to the religion. You still have to accept that because it's the haq. And we're ordered to, find the haq, to, to, to follow and find the haq. Then he said, and they would advise their companions and followers to accept the truth, even if it appeared in someone else's statements. An example of this is found in Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his saying, when he stated his opinion concerning the dowry of a woman, of women. A woman responded to him by reciting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, ayat, but if you intend to replace a wife with another, and you have given one of them a qintar, uh, a large amount of gold in, in uh, dowry, take not the least bit of it back. Upon this, Umar went back on his opinion and said, a woman has spoken correctly and a man has erred. And it has also been reported that he said, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, everyone is more understanding of fiqh than Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Subhanallah, look at the humility of the Sahabi Jalil one who was in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one who was the Khalifa of the Muslims, one who was the third, uh, the second Khalifa of the Muslims, after Abu Bakr, Abu, uh, Abu Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een. So this shows you the humility that we have to have in accepting the truth from wherever it comes. Some of the famous scholars used to say, upon having formed an opinion concerning a manner, this is the opinion that we have derived. So anyone that brings an opinion better than it, we shall accept it from him. Imam Shafi used to go to great extents with regards to this understanding, for he would advise his companions to follow the truth and accept the sunnah, even if, if it should appear to them in contradiction to their own opinions. And he encouraged them to, at that point, throw his opinion against the wall, meaning throw it away, discard his, his ruling. He would say in, in his books, there is no doubt that you will find in them my opinions, that which con contradicts the book and the sunnah. For Allah the Almighty says, and if it, the Quran, were from someone other than Allah, they would have found many contradictions in it. And what is more profound than this is his saying, no one ever debated me except that I noticed either the truth was manifested on his tongue or on my tongue. So this shows us, look at the A'amma, the great Imams. They didn't order you to blind follow them and to make ta'asim and take their opinion over anything else, even at the expense of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. No, they never called to this. All the great Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam, uh, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam uh, Ahmed, 
all those great imams, uh, Imam Ibn Hazm, and the imams of the Salaf, and the later Aimma, no one from them, not one of them, do we have authentic reports says, take my statements and discard the book and the sunnah. Take my statements and disregard the madhab of the Salaf. La. Because they knew that the truth is what we are ordered to follow and not the opinions of men. This indicates that his intention was for nothing else but to manifest the truth, even if it were found in the tongue of someone other than him, such as those who debated or differed with him. Ta'zim wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya na muhammad ala wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam.